Hello and welcome to The Guardian Film Show and an eclectic week of new releases that run the gamut from tub-thumping satire to survivalist drama, octogenarian tennis to the curious antics of Marina Abramovich. Some of it may even qualify as art. Don't know, we'll probably discuss that later. In the meantime, let's start with the previews. Coming up in this week's show, the contestants in ping pong are over 80 and picking up speed. Willem Dafoe chases tigers in red weather as the hunter. And the Museum of Modern Art hosts an installation with a difference. In Marina Abramovich, the artist is present. But we'll begin, as we so often do, in a fit of self-righteous rage. Bobcat Goldthwaite's new comedy is called God Bless America, but I'm not sure he quite means it. This is the oh no, you didn't say that generation, where a shocking comment has more weight than the truth. No one has any shame anymore, and we're, we're supposed to celebrate it. Writer-director Bobcat Goldthwaite is as mad as hell, and he's not going to take it anymore. God Bless America is a wanton bit of flag burning, as Joel Murray plays the lowly worm who turns his fire on road hogs, religious fundamentalists and reality TV contestants. I'm sure the girls from Two Girls, One Cup are going to have their own dating show on VH1 any day now. I, I mean, why have a civilization anymore if we no longer are interested in being civilised? Joining me now to review the week's releases is Guardian film critic Peter Bradshaw. Hello. There. Hello. Hello. Peter, how did you find this? Did this get your hackles up? Um, I found it... Very, very obvious from the get-go. I've always been very interested in Bobcat Goldthwait. When I, f I think it was when I first saw his outrageous cameo in the Larry Sanders show, playing himself, playing mm. this kind of wild man of rock and roll figure, which appears to be absolutely accurate. And then I watched his movies as a director, which I thought were very good. Sleeping uh, Dogs Lie. Sleeping was Dogs very Lie good. was a very disturbing study of emotional incorrectness. A really kind of interesting, funny little movie. And then World's Greatest Dad again kind of subversive and interesting. This I just thought was so obvious. It's about this guy played by Joel Murray. Uh, brother of Bill. Brother of Bill. He as this divorced, scuzzy loser living in this loser's apartment forms a kind of sort of platonic Bonnie and Clyde relationship with this angry, alienated teenage girl. And they go on a kind of a rampage together, taking on all the nasty, ugly, stupid and dumb things about America, the insidious things about America that they don't like in a kind of orgy of righteous violence. One of the things that gets his go is, is shock jocks. And yet yeah. this, this seems like, like shock jock cinema, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, all, it's all, don't you just hate it when don't people you, park yes. across two car parking slots? What's the deal with teenagers today? Yes. Yes. And it was just all these kind of bumper sticker kind yeah. of knee-jerk fury moments. Yes, there was one interesting moment when they take on a shock jock uh, and they have this sort of angry and violent confrontation with him. And then the Joel, the Joel Murray figure says, well, it, it's not that I disagree with all of what you say. And the girl says, what? What do you mean? And he says, well, guns. I like guns. And I thought for one moment, my goodness, this is interesting. Is the movie going to take off in a new direction? They say, well, you know, he's a bit of a dirty Harry figure. And he mm. kind of, in his libertarian way, has kind of gone beyond right and left. And he is a kind of a shock jock himself. But no, that's one of the things in the movie which is sort of abandoned, really. It's not something that Bobcat Goldthwait well, really of, is all that interested in. He about. sanctifies these characters, doesn't yeah. he? They're that, his mouthpieces for all yeah. the things that he's angry about, but yeah. therefore they have to be purely justified in all yeah. of their actions. I don't know. I thought this was pretty, pretty Route 1, pretty, pretty lame stuff. <laughs> Frank, don't. Let me... I'm recording this. Thanks for turning off your cell phone. You're welcome. God bless America, they're shouting and railing like a drunk on the bus. Um, let's leave that one behind and stare deep into the eyes of Marina Abramovic, the Serbian performance artist who basically sat on a chair at New York's Museum of Modern Art for three months and invited the world to sit down with her. Director Matthew Akers was there to record what happened next. Are you nervous about the show at the moment, or are you not nervous? Incredibly. I'm always nervous even if I give a speech. I sit in the toilet for days. <laughs> Good. If I'm not nervous, then I'm nervous why I'm not nervous. <laughs> it involved her sitting motionless, virtually, for three months. Um, every hour the Museum of Modern Art in New York City was open. 
there was a chair in front of her and anyone from the, uh, the public was invited to come and sit uh, for however long they wanted and have what she calls an energy exchange or an energy dialogue with her. There's a great line in the film which says the hardest thing to do is, is the thing that's closest to nothing. I thought, oh God, like how do you film that? How do you make a movie out of that? She's going to be sitting doing nothing for three months. Um, but, you know, I came to understand that there's a lot of complexity within that uh, very simple statement and that very simple act. Um, she really, it's a challenge to everyone to, you know, be present, to slow down, to uh, stop and have a genuine connection with another person, another human being. Peter, it's a bit like us here, isn't it? It is, it is. It's not quite as compelling as <laughs> us here. It doesn't quite have the 21st century resonance of what we're doing. Less hand on heart Yes, well. exactly, yes. Hand somewhere else. I don't know, who knows. Uh, I, to my shame, really knew nothing about Marina Abramovich before I sat down to this film, but I was actually, I, I was kind of gripped by it. I thought it was great. It's, it's one of the, she's one of these things, she's easily mockable, but in a way, because it's so obviously mockable, it turns aside kind of critical or mm. derisory objection. Mm. Uh, she's a fascinating figure. She's an authentic diva, and part of her artistry, it seems to me, her off-the-record artistry, in ma is making people do what she wants. Yeah. Well, she's I spent the first half of this film thinking, I really can't bear this woman. She's, yeah. she's awful. And then you, when the actual show happens, you think, oh, yeah, okay, she's there's, there's of, yes, validity she's sort of there. Brilliant. She yeah. has, she's an absolute prima donna assoluta mm. of the world of performance art. And I must say, I found it However absurd it is, and of course it is a little absurd, uh, there are brilliant things in it. For example, her, one of her brilliant inventions, as far as I can see, is to get a naked man and a naked woman, both sort of young and attractive, to stand in a, a doorway and make people walk through them, just edging yeah. through them. And, it's, and, she, and the film shows... It's a bit Bunuel-esque, isn't it? It's very Bunuel-esque. It's absolutely brilliant because you can see the expressions on people's faces. It's priceless because... And the film, Matthew Akers, shows it two or three times to very good effect. What faces they have to put on. Mm. Do they look blank or, or sort of... Oh, you there shocked. was a lot of the thousand-yard yeah. stare, uh, whereas I'm not saying this. Thousand-yard stare, yes. Every people... Did, <laughs> absurd. They seem to, these people seem to suffer the most massive sense of humor loss and it's interesting because her work is about intimacy and that's a it's superb it's it's simple it's absurd but it's inspired but it's topped in a way by the simplicity and clarity of her new idea which is to get people just to stare into your face I had some sympathy with some of the people that are, are actively trying to be a part of this happening, this yeah. installation, whatever yeah. it is. There's the woman who takes her dress off and wants to sit yeah. there naked and is hurled out by the bouncers. She's hauled out, yeah. I get the impression that Marina Abramovich herself might have been minded under other circumstances to intervene and maybe let that woman sit down and look at her stark naked, but she couldn't afford to get involved in every single little argument. But I think really what we're talking about is an interesting point. The face, the human face, something that's taken for granted as the primal seat of our identity and personality, mm. we don't look at it. Mm. We look at it for a few seconds and then look away. Yeah. Under what other circumstances do we stare intently at somebody's face, apart from what we're doing now, of course? Taking a piece out of the performer's life has a value. Time is not an ephemeral just rushing by. Just imagine time as an unbearably large object you cannot move and you are caught in. From one solitary vigil to the next now, as Willem Dafoe leaves civilization behind and heads up the mountain through the forest in search of the Tasmanian tiger. The hunter sends Willem Dafoe into the forests of Tasmania on a mission to catch a mythic tiger prized by a shadowy biotech corporation. But this forest is not quite virgin territory. It's a battleground of eco-warriors and logging companies, haunted by the ghost of a missing man. It's all that Dafoe can do to keep his mind on the job and his eye on the footprints. Peter, I guess if you want an actor who epitomised the conflict between nature and civilization, you, you can't do much worse than Willem Dafoe. No, uh, he's such an interesting performer. He kind of brings an absolute kind of dignity and self-possession 
to everything that he does. It reminded me a little bit of, of his performance in Antichrist, in a way, the same sort of thing, but all at the expense, I think, of a certain opaque quality. I'm not sure whether that's deliberate or whether that's just how Willem Dafoe is. Mm. He just always looks like that. Uh, I wasn't sure what to make of this film. I thought it had a fascinating premise. I love the idea that this guy who you think is a conventional assassin with all the assassin's traditional attributes, mm. you know, he's disciplined, he's solitary, he's rather ascetic. He's a samurai. He's a samurai, yes, the classic samurai thing. And then he's summoned for a meeting at a faceless intercontinental hotel for the brief and the setup. It's all classic stuff. And then you realize that what he's got to kill isn't, as it were, uh, a president or something like that, but he's got to kill a rare Tasmanian tiger thought to be extinct for 80 years. Yeah. Uh, and he has to kill it and bring its DNA back home to be cloned by this awful exploitative company. And that premise, I thought, was great. But then, really, absolutely nothing about the film is really all that convincing. I didn't really believe in any of it, really, it's from about, then on. But I, for a film that's, that's priding itself on its sort of m hushed minimalism, it yeah. did seem to be like five films in one, didn't Yeah, it? I, I thought when it was just alone in the Tasmanian yeah, wilderness, it was terrific. I could have watched that for two hours, just with almost nothing going mm. on at all. But instead, we've got this rather politically correct, emotionally correct sort of subplot about how he gets billeted somehow at the house of an eco-warrior who's apparently gone off into the bush the looking for exactly the same, exactly the same beast. Uh, again, it's a rather untied plot strand, basically. And of course, there is the uh, beautiful woman left behind, Frances O'Connor and her two kids, and of course, he becomes a quasi paterfamilias to them. Again, it's a little bit hand-me-down, that whole thing. It's a mm. little bit kind of touchy-feely, really, whereas yeah. the, uh, the basic thing of him well, having to kill this animal... It's the call of the wild and the call yeah. of the home. The call of the home. I just found the call of the home boring. Yeah. Well, you've always <laughs> had. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm such a, such a badass myself. <laughs> Jarrah thought that somebody was following him, though. Not one of the locals. Well, if not them, who? My husband pissed off a lot of people. Did you tell the police? Yeah, they said there was no evidence. No uh, body. Besides, they knew Jarrah, his theories, what he was like, so. Do you believe someone was following him? I believe he believed it. Willem Dafoe on the trail of the Tasmanian tiger. Now, as Peter was saying, the Tasmanian tiger has actually been extinct for about 80 years, which means that some of the people in ping pong may once have met one. The heroes and heroines of ping pong take to the table at the over 80s World Table Tennis Championship, hustling for victory and slicing lethal serves as they battle the Grim Reaper into a fifth and final set. And judging from the skills on display in this documentary, our money's on them. And she's never won gold. No, no. Well, she have won, and here are many competitions, but uh, the World Championship, no. How do you think you'd do against those tennis players, then? I would do very, very badly. I'm in awe of them, basically. I think, is ping pong the secret of eternal life, never mind long life. I, I'm absolutely in awe of these people, and it also, this film also brings home to you the ageism of most other things that we see on screens, big and small. Yeah. I mean, you never get to talk to old people for any length of time and realize that they are actually individual people and not just old people. It doesn't entirely sentimentalize it either, not entirely, does it? Not entirely. I mean, a bit, but a little the bit, actual yes. competition is yeah. just as competitions are... It's just are... as brutal, yeah. There's, there's dirty tricks, some guy gets his bat stolen, there's a little bit of trash talking. Uh, there's the Someone Aust gets their hips stolen. Yeah, yes. <laughs> there's a, the Austrian woman and the German woman talking nastily about each other in German, and it's not quite clear whether they know that they can be understood. Mm. Uh, and, of course, there's a fear of losing. The fear of losing is as nasty now as... Nasty when you're 85 as when yeah. you're 25. So is this a documentary about old people who play sport, or is it a sports documentary? I, I don't know. The question of is it a good sports movie is an interesting one because a good sports movie traditionally is an underdog movie mm. where somebody's the underdog but somebody's the nasty mean overdog mm. but they're all underdogs in a way everybody's an underdog yeah. there aren't any you know if they had to play a nasty mean kind of 30 year old then yeah it would be an yeah. underdog sports yeah. movie played exactly. by Vince Vaughn exactly <laughs> it would be exactly <laughs> this, this, this old girl I should I don't care how good she is, I should get her. She can't move. 
She's 100 years old. She gets away with murder. <laughs> the powerhouses of ping pong there, a film that should inspire us all. Uh, it certainly inspired Peter and I. We're off to get a pint. See you next week. <laughs>